Hi, this is your host Bhutan Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. Today we have with us George Castro, Developer Relations at CNCF. You're at the AI.dev conference. I was supposed to be there as well, but I had to change my plans at the last moment. Uh, so I'm missing the conference. So I want to hear from you, how has been the conference so far? It's been, it's been amazing. It feels like I've learned six months worth of technology in about one and a half days. Um, not even counting the, um, uh, the the hallway conversations, but it's always good to see um, large organizations that are doing AI at scale be able to share their expertise. So um, interesting talks this morning from NVIDIA, Amazon, Hugging Face was on earlier. Um, just seeing uh, the, 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 the scale, level of scale that uh, people are doing uh, cloud native deployments and AI on top uh, has been really um, so, so surprise. I'm like, you know that it's happening, but you know when when you get into the technical details and someone's in a talk and they're kind of talking about the the numbers, uh, you know, once 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 you see all the zeros at the end, you start to understand the level of scale that we're talking about. Um, that even in a cloud native context is is still much larger than than we've seen in the past, and that's always very exciting. Today's main topic is generative AI, of course, because of this conference. When I was at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in Chicago, generative AI was a major discussion point there. A lot of companies, they are using generative AI in products and production. I want to hear from you, what does Gen AI mean for cloud native? At the same time, what does cloud native mean for Gen AI? First of all, it's, it's, there, there are organizations that are built their AI on top of Kubernetes, Bloomberg, CERN, OpenAI, NVIDIA. Uh, I already mentioned Hugging Face. Um, so there are organizations out there that have been doing that, and it's due to Kubernetes' extensible nature. You know, we're all we're always talking about the API-driven uh, being able to extend outside the core primitives and things like that. Now that it's been a few years of having these things in production, I think uh, CERN's demo two years ago, uh, you know, was, was was kind of talking about all of these things. And now that these end user organizations have been out figuring out at that level of scale, because you can't figure it out unless you're doing it at scale. Um, now's the time when there's interest on bringing those primitives and lessons learned back into Kubernetes to kind of give people that more out of the box batteries included experience that they expect from invisible infrastructure. So in Kubernetes itself, you're seeing a bunch of CAPs, which are Kubernetes enhancement proposals uh, over the past uh, year. And you're going to keep seeing them uh, coming up more around dynamic resource allocation, uh, batch scheduling, and just things that remove a lot of the complexity for getting high throughput, low latency workloads in there. And AI is kind of a natural fit to that. So uh, as Kubernetes is turning 10 next year, uh, we we kind of moving from the mindset of um, uh, web apps to uh, workloads that look more like AI. So uh, Clayton Coleman said that inference is the new web app, um, and, and that is something that uh, was mentioned during one of the keynotes at, at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in Chicago, and is is been one of the um, kind of mantras that you're hearing uh, core developers and people that are involved in the core kind of repeating over and over again uh, to themselves is that um, the end users as AI has come to take over are, are, are pushing cloud native in, in this manner um, due to the extensibility of the API. And for us, it's just trying to grab those carbon patterns and, and put it in a way that commoditizes it, puts it upstream, and, and so that end users can get that economies of scale. And that's why they choose cloud native to begin with. So yeah, it's a, bit, it's a very exciting time right now. Now, time passes by so fast. It's been almost 10 years since Kubernetes came to exist, and it's been used in production. And yeah. I mean, there are so many awesome use cases, of course, like CERN, that and thousands, of course. I feel that Kubernetes mm -hmm. is a technology of same magnitude scale uh, as is the Linux kernel. It's a very mature foundation for organizations to build their products and services on top of it. Can you talk about how does this maturity of Kubernetes and other CNC of hosted cloud native technologies? Yeah, so if you if you consider Kubernetes like the kernel, uh, right? It's um, 
the kernel is very interesting in the early days, right? And then eventually people care about the application. So as Kubernetes kind of gets gains these primitives and becomes less important, we start to look at other things in the cloud native landscape uh, projects like Kubeflow or Volcano or so, uh, there's 174 projects in the cloud native landscape. And all of them are now starting to find new niches and new uh, uses for uh, what what um, AI users are looking for. So for any, everything from Caverno to OPA, that's policy that you can run on your cluster, you're going to want that for your AI stuff as well, right? So for a lot of them, it's it's once the bottom kernel primitives are handled, they're already kind of leaning forward in the saddle, and, and many of these projects are being used in production. Kubeflow just had a release uh, in November and has been used in production uh, for a very long time. It, it's one of the earliest AI projects on top of cloud native. And it, it now that uh, it's just hitting production, AI in general is just hitting production in so many places, now's the time for those projects to kind of shine. And for us, that's where the importance of having those healthy community processes to ensure that these projects continue to be to uh, remain sustainable uh, from a contribution perspective, because uh, the more production users you get, the more issues you're going to find, and that um, virtuous cycle of contributors and consumers, we need to make sure that that's healthy, and that's pretty much my day job, right? It's uh, making sure the contributors are finding places where they can express themselves and contribute and learn and do what they want to do, what they get out of open source. That's that's the reason you contribute. Um, but also be able to provide value to those end user companies that want to consume uh, the projects. And doing that together in a way that's fair and neutral and fun for everybody and inclusive is, is I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the mission. <laughs> and as organizations are embracing generative AI with cloud native technologies, what are some of the pain points that they have to deal with, whether it's about hardware, infrastructure, scalability, security, and how is CNCF community helping them or can help them? There's three places. The first is going to be hardware enablement, you know, GPUs, TPUs, uh, dynamic resource allocation. There's a Kubernetes enhancement proposal. That is one of them is very busy. That's that's where a lot of activity is happening right now. And uh, there's been a lot of work in batch scheduling as well that has been landed over the past 18 months. That's kind of quiet. I was surprised. I was, it felt for me when I discovered it, it was kind of flying under the radar. That kind of is, is important stuff. Um, and, and kind of making that stuff simpler for people is, is, is something that um, Kubernetes is always kind of, Str struggled with, right? Like making it simpler for people while keeping it powerful and ex extensive sometimes feels like mutually exclusive features. And then the last bit is going to be uh, the applications themselves. You know, I uh, think, think things like Kubeflow are, are just, just the beginning of applications on top. There's, there's still in, in the Kubernetes space, we're kind of still concentrating on keeping the field um, fertilized, you know, and ready to go so that when the seeds come, that they're healthy and, and ready to go. And we're still, we're still in the early days of this where um, uh, we, we need to get, especially the hardware enablement stuff kind of sorted out in a way that's, um, you shouldn't have to be CERN to get, to get the stuff, right? <laughs> and um, one of the great things about the model is the being able to have the end users participate in open source as closely as they have been. Uh, a lot of these organizations are have been involved deeply with open source so that um, you get the stuff faster. <laughs> um, and for, for us, it's making sure that that process is as efficient as possible. And that's why we do it all in the open. So when I mention a CAP, you know, um, any anyone in the community can participate. You can listen in. Um, there's There's no secret meeting, as far as I know. Um, and you could just participate in the meetings and all the issues and things like that. And that's kind of what people want to see. Um, when there's a transformative technology like this, there's always people who understand that it needs to be open and collaborative. And that's the way to move an industry forward. And the way we do that in open source is just by doing it, right? It's like, you know, here's, here's the GitHub issue. You can subscribe to it and you participate. And organizations that are leaning forward in the cloud native space are, are the ones that are really um, 
being able to accelerate their own efforts um, so they can build what they want. It becomes a bit tricky when you talk about open source as well because it's not as easy as the land stack. There you have four or five components and they're all open source. Uh, the Biden administration also came out with an executive order to kind of ensure that AI, generative AI is safe for human consumption. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit about open source and generative AI? I think it's a whole new skill set of people. Um, here, here at the cluster level, I got a lot of ops background, you know, container nerds uh, doing that kind of thing. I've, I've met people at this conference, students, um, data scientists. It's an entirely different skill set of people that bring an entirely new outlook on how to solve a problem, right? Because we can't really design a thing by ourselves, right? Like we can't just make a thing and say, here, consume it. That That's that's a process that involves both the end user and the people that are producing it at different levels. So down to the cluster hardware level, all the way up to the people that are consuming the projects that I talked about earlier that are going to be doing that. And I think it opens it up for a bunch of people who are less technical um, when it comes to the operational stuff, right? Like we want them to do their science, not have to worry about the scalability of their cluster and things like that. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity to bring a new diverse set of skill sets into open source that uh, is always exciting. Like, you know, open source has been, you and I have been around a while, right? It's started with a bunch of Linux nerds and things like that. And when's open source going to reach uh, the rest of the uh, uh, scientific fields in the world, right? And with data science, you're, you're, that's just happening. Um, so being able to see people that might not have any knowledge about the cloud native stuff, but have deep knowledge on, on AI and things like that. And it's just, um, it's a good melding of, of, you know, they, they have a place they want to go. We have the tools. We just need to know how to get them there. And it's the same problem for them, except the other way around. So that leads to a lot of interesting discussions and, and seeing, familiar faces, but also a bunch of new faces who have never experienced open source. And if this is their gateway into open source, you know me, I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> that's, how we, uh, that's how we move forward. And when we look at Genity UI, we do talk about developer and actually even at the KubeCon, CloudNity Con, uh, we had a lot of discussions about the whole developer experience. Uh, can you talk a bit about when we look at CNCF and you know your role as developer relation, what plans do you folks have to enable, empower, engage developers with all these open source you know, projects that you folks have? Yeah, so uh, for me, I, it, it's all about efficiency, right? Um, when we built a lot of the processes, the open source processes uh, in things like Kubernetes and Cloud Native in that first decade, Right now, it's it's, it's about um, making that even more efficient. Before it was really uh, you you could kind of afford to only hang out in the cloud native area. But with something like AI, it brings in all sorts of different foundations and all sorts of software projects. So now PyTorch is involved. Totally different foundation. Apache is an important player in the space. Uh, the CNCF itself. Uh, the rest of the Linux Foundation projects, all of a sudden you have this common thread of AI that kind of ties it all together. And each part of the stack is getting exercised now. And it almost feels like the first 10 years you had different pockets of technology that were evolving at different rates built around open, that open source substrate. But now in order for AI to succeed, due to the scale that you have to have, like you can't, you cannot do this unless you have the scale. Now is really, uh, I'm starting to see a lot more cross-collaboration, uh, starting to see people who are wearing multiple hats and multiple organizations kind of trying to tie it all together. Um, so you might see someone that has one foot in cloud native and one foot in the open SSF foundation or one in the AI and then one in the cloud native. And then there's another person that has one in all three, all kind of going towards the same mission on how we can serve, have the technology serve um, the end user in a way that's sustainable for contributors. So the, it's a lot of the common patterns and it comes down to more human organization than the technology itself. And that is, that's our generational challenge. I think being able to scale that across multiple organizations 
multiple tech stacks uh, in a way that's sustainable, I think is 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 our next 10 year goal. All of the content here, all of the projects I've talked about, all of the talks here are all available online. Um, you, um, you mentioned growing up with the LAMP stack, right? I remember struggling days trying to figure out your LAMP stack. These days, the amount of software, it's the opposite problem. You're overwhelmed with the amount of software and content out here. The amount of expertise that's available on the YouTube channels for this conference alone is, is immeasurable. I, if you're students or you're just getting starting in, the, in this technology, um, we're here. You know, uh, we're, we're documenting everything that, the best that we can. And uh, we're just looking for more people to dive in and get involved. So all of these projects, always looking for contributors, um, writing things like contributor guides, mentorship programs. That's always something that's on uh, front of mind for us. So, you know, if uh, don't be afraid to dive in. Um, um, it's always a learning process. And, uh, you know, we strive to be a place where you can learn and do what you want to do. Build what you want. I mean, I don't even have to mention that, but the, f the fact is that Kubernetes cloud native is complicated. It was not meant to be easy. Um, but when it comes to generative AI, how do you see that the whole CNCF ecosystem helping customers deal with this complexity? That's a hard problem, right? It's like you see all this stuff and you want it. And um, sometimes you have that... Uh, you know, you go to a conference and, oh, all the cool kids are using this stuff. Are we behind? Or, you know, uh, how are we supposed to consume this? And, you know, a, a lot of it is just having the uh, the foresight to dive in. What I like to tell people is um, just being involved doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, figure it all out by yourself. In a lot of places, just being in the room and just being able to keep track of things are going and being smart about where um, – you put your time and where you want to contribute. So what I tell people is find out what's most important to you and just get involved and you'd be surprised how much just by reading the release notes of software that you, um, you know, might be interested in. After a little while, you start to learn things. And when you come to a, a conference is a, one of the great places where you can go to get up to speed uh, with people who have been in your shoes before. There's nobody in this. Everyone who's at these conferences has has been a novice at one point. And we've been around long enough and know enough about open source sustainability that the only way this works is by ensuring that everybody else is also learning from each other. So what I, what I try to tell people is don't be afraid to say when you – uh, you know, you need help or, or you want to be able to spin up on technology and there's plenty of people there available to help you uh, do that kind of thing. Because this really is one of those things where as an industry, um, the health of the entire industry and how people consume this technology is part of the open source model. Like we can't have a healthy ecosystem unless this is on front of mind. So that's why we kind of take it seriously. And um yeah, that's why we take it seriously. You know, if you're not if you're not having a good time consuming this stuff, then you know I'm going to work a little bit harder to make sure you can. So, uh, when when everybody has that attitude, we we move forward and we iterate and we we move as fast as we can. You folks have you know a special interest group or six you know or working groups. Uh, talk a bit about if there are any special interest groups focused on generative AI? So a lot, a lot of the things in the CNCF are going to be to support those AI workloads. So there's a, a few SIGs and working groups uh, that we should mention. SIG node in Kubernetes right now is, is a hot topic. That's where people are looking. There are two batch working groups, one at the Kubernetes level and one at the CNCF level. And there there's um, almost, almost each of the meetings that I sit in on a lot of CNCF project meetings, and there's an AI topic being discussed probably every single day. Um, and, you know, I'm only attending a fraction of those meetings. So it's it's one of those things where it's uh, find out the thing that interests you. Um, and if you sit in a meeting, someone's going to bring up AI at one point, and then that's that's where you can start, right? And that's the thread that you can pull on and, and get started. I mean, when you look at the adoption of genetic AI and apprehension and fear, I think it was the same when it was in the early days of Linux kernel or when the Docker containers came out 
or when we started talking about, hey, everybody should move to the cloud and all the applications about cloud or Kubernetes. So it feels like, you know, the, we are just going to the same cycle when it comes to Genet AI and things will mature over time. Major, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, Genet AI in the context of uh, CNCF, Kubernetes, Cloud Native. Uh, thanks for all those great insights and I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you in Paris. Thanks. 